Welcome to my channel, where the scariest stories come to life. Before we dive into today's chilling tale, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you never miss a story. Now, let's get into the horror. I had always been drawn to the solitude of nature, finding solace in the untouched beauty that lay beyond the concrete jungle. So, when the opportunity arose to take a solo hiking trip along the shores of Lake Michigan, I eagerly packed my backpack, ready for an adventure that would free my soul. As I arrived at the trailhead, the morning sun spilled its golden rays across the vast expanse of the lake. The air was crisp and refreshing, carrying with it that faint scent of pine trees. As I set foot on the trail, a sense of excitement mingled with the tranquility of the surroundings. The path stretched out before me, winding through the dense forest, promising hidden treasures at every turn. For hours, I immersed myself in the natural wonders that surrounded me. The towering trees formed a majestic canopy overhead, casting intriguing shadows on the ground below. The forest floor was carpeted with fallen leaves, their vibrant hues heralding autumn's arrival. The gentle rustling of the foliage beneath my boots was the only sound, apart from the occasional chirping of birds. As the day wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It was a subtle sensation, like a whisper in the wind, but it sent shivers down my spine. Nonetheless, I paused, scanning my surroundings, looking for any sign of movement or life. Yet, the forest remained eerily still, as if holding its breath. Convinced it was my imagination playing tricks on me, I pressed on, determined to reach my destination before nightfall. But as evening descended, a strange noise pierced the stillness. It was distant, faint, yet undeniably unnatural. It sounded like a muffled whimper, as if someone or something was in distress. My curiosity was piqued. I veered off the trail, following the sound deeper into the woods. With every step, the noise grew louder, yet it didn't seem to get any closer. It echoed through the trees, bouncing off trunks and branches, making it impossible to discern its origin. Branches snapped underfoot as I forged ahead, my heart pounding in my chest, a mix of fear and anticipation coursing through my veins. Suddenly, the noise ceased, leaving me standing in eerie silence. I strained my ears, hoping to catch any trace of its return. Then, behind a cluster of trees, I saw a flicker of movement. I quickened my pace, drawn toward the source of the mysterious sound. As I rounded the last tree, my breath caught in my throat. Before me stood a dilapidated shack, its wooden planks weathered and worn by time. The air surrounding it seemed heavy, as if carrying the weight of forgotten secrets. The whimpering sound emanated from within, growing louder and more disturbing with every passing moment. Summoning all of my courage, I pushed open the creaking door, revealing a scene that would forever haunt my dreams. The shack's interior was shrouded in darkness, save for a single ray of light streaming through a cracked window, illuminating a ghastly sight. Lining the walls were rows upon rows of cages, each holding a different creature, a macabre menagerie of twisted nightmares. Some had feral eyes and sharp teeth, their bodies contorted in unnatural shapes. Others were skeletal and emaciated, their skin clinging desperately to their frames. The stench of decay hung heavy in the air, mingling with the pitiful cries that echoed through the room. Terror gripped me as I realized the true horror of the situation. These creatures, trapped and tormented, were the source of the haunting sounds I had heard throughout my hike. Someone had inflicted unspeakable cruelty on these terrified creatures, subjecting them to unimaginable suffering. I could feel their pain resonating into the depths of my soul, compelling me to take action. With trembling hands, I fumbled for my phone and dialed emergency services. As I relayed the details of the horrific discovery, my voice quivered with fear and determination. The operator assured me that help was coming, urging me to stay put until the authorities arrived. I obeyed, unable to tear myself away from the pitiful creatures trapped within the cages. Once filled with despair, their eyes now seemed to hold a glimmer of hope as they sensed salvation drawing near. Time seemed to stretch agonizingly long as I waited for the sound of approaching sirens, yearning for this nightmare to end. 
Finally, the distant wail of emergency vehicles reached my ears, slicing through the heavy silence. Relief flooded my being, but I couldn't help feeling haunted by the atrocities I had witnessed. I knew that even as the captives were set free, the scars of their torment would forever mar their existence. The rescue operation unfolded with precision and urgency. Along with animal welfare organizations, law enforcement officers arrived, dismantling the grotesque menagerie and providing medical attention to the surviving creatures. Their dedication and compassion in the face of such darkness rekindled a flicker of faith within me. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an ethereal glow over the scene, I slowly returned to the trail. Once serene and comforting, the air now carried a weight of sorrow. The forest was no longer as inviting as it once had been. I walked with heavy footsteps, burdened by the knowledge that evil could lurk in even the most picturesque corners of the world. The beauty I had once admired now felt tainted, tarnished by the grotesque acts I had witnessed. The shadows stretched before me, their elongated forms dancing in the fading light, reminding me of the darkness that could consume the purest of intentions. That solo hiking trip, which began with a thirst for solitude, had transformed into a journey of enlightenment and purpose. Though scarred by the horrors I had seen, I emerged with newfound determination to be a voice for the voiceless. The echoes of that haunting whimper would forever reverberate in my heart, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurks in the world, and the unwavering need to bring light to its darkest corners. I grew up in the state of Michigan, in a town called Port Austin, right on the Great Lake of Lake Huron. It's a small town with not much to do besides perusing the small mom-and-pop shops or going to the diner in the center of town and checking out some cool classic cars at the show held once a week. Whenever I could, I chose to escape the mundanity and go to my father's cabin in the neighboring city of Grindstone. It was a small community town with nothing but woods, farmland, and a nice area for hunting and fishing, again on the shores of Lake Huron. At the time, I was 14 years old, and I went up for the weekend with my older brother, a marine straight out of Iraq, returning home that same weekend from a short hunting trip. My brother was tough as nails, and he wasn't afraid of anything. But that day, I would see a side of him I wouldn't soon forget. We took the ATV and headed out to a cornfield with an abandoned farmhouse to set the scene. We were hunting pheasant in the cornfield that opens up to a clearing, and beyond that is the beautiful Lake Huron. We entered from the opposite side, which is a smaller, lighter, woodsy area but has a trail where we parked the ATV that leads out to the cornfield. We headed out fairly late, sometime around 4 p.m. after fishing earlier that day and not having much luck. We were deciding to head back at around 7 p.m. As we were exploring the abandoned farmhouse, my brother sat down for a cigarette and called me over to the front to check something out. His face was pale and he choked on his words. He told me to look over there and pointed. I saw a huge wolf, about 300 yards in the clearing ahead of me, standing on its hind legs. This thing was massive and covered in thick black fur. I couldn't really see how tall it was from the distance, but its legs looked huge. This thing was muscular with an oddly shaped torso and long, slender hind legs. My brother told me to grab one of the shotguns. When it heard him, it turned and looked directly at us, seeming to leer slightly. It then took a few strides on its hind legs, then went down on all fours and darted into the cornfield in the direction of our ATV. It was starting to get dark. The sky was red, purple, and orange. We decided to enter the cornfield from the farthest end where the wolf had gone. I was on flashlight duty to see all of our surroundings while he walked ahead of me with a shotgun. The entire time, I felt like I was being watched, and I swear I heard nearby rustling and low growls and snarls when we would stop. Eventually, what should have been a 10-minute walk seemed to take an hour. We made it to the trail where the ATV was parked. I started to calm down now that I could see my surroundings better when I heard the classic horror movie cliché, a branch or twig snapping, followed by rustling in the cornfield behind us. I shined the flashlight on a patch of stalks where I thought I heard the movement, and sure enough, I saw a pair of yellow reflective eyes about six feet high through a crack in the corn stalks. 
My brother yelled at it to F asterisk asterisk K off, then it let out an eerie howl that sounded like it was right in my ear. My brother fired one shot, hitting the top of the corn stalks, and then told me to hightail it to the ATV and get it started. I did, and when I felt him jump on the back after me, I punched the throttle and floored it across to the access road and onto the main road that cuts through the town. I looked behind me once or twice and saw a huge black mass dart across the road quickly from out of the cornfield into the darkness of the woods. We headed back to our house in town that night and didn't return until about 12 p.m. the next day to collect our things from the cabin. Still unnerved, I had always heard the rumors of the Michigan dogman, but I thought it was just an old wife's tale, like the boogeyman that my dad used to scare me with as a kid. I figured it was just some urban legend, like the skunk ape of Florida or the chupacabra. To this day, my brother and I talk about it over some beers, but it was definitely a scary experience for both of us. I still go hunting in those parts to this day, but haven't seen anything since, and I hope I never do again. So, I was in seventh grade and really into music and going to concerts. My dad told me we could see Badfinger and War at a free show in Toledo, Ohio. As far as I know, they have this concert every year, it's called Party in the Park, and it takes place at this lovely park right on the banks of Lake Erie. I was a little hippie who wore rose-colored glasses. My favorite band was the Beatles, so of course, I was ecstatic to see a band that had been signed to Apple Records. I was also psyched to see War because I loved Low Rider and Spill the Wine, if I recall correctly, Badfinger was playing one day, and then a day or two later, War played. I think I also had the opportunity to see Blue Oyster Cult, but I passed. Anyway, I went to see Badfinger. I got my picture taken and an autograph from Joey Moland, so I was in my 60s music nerd heaven. My dad kept wandering off to get food or beer or to talk to people he knew in the crowd. My mom probably would have flipped out if she had known that my dad was leaving little Timmy unattended at a free concert in Toledo, especially on the banks of Lake Erie. A lot of crazy stuff happens here, but I didn't mind a bit because I was feeling grown up and independent, after all, I had just met an absolute rock star, so obviously, I was okay, and nothing terrible would ever happen. That same day, something so extraordinary happened that it punctured my happy little cloud. It got dark quickly after the concert, and I really wanted to go home, but my dad kept running into people he knew and chatting with them. He bumped into some guy, and the guy tried to show him his new boat, parked or docked or whatever, right there within sight of the stage at the concert. I was pumped to get on this boat and hang out, after all, there were these super hot older men, by which I mean two guys who were probably 17 with slightly above average looks, on board. I was shy and clumsy, and I worried I would struggle to get onto the boat without falling over, so I said I'd hang out within sight of the ship and people watch. And my dad was like, cool, whatever, let me on that boat. I was standing there probably cheesing, pondering just how fantastic my day had been when this guy walked up to me and kind of shattered my bubble. He was almost seven feet tall, solid, and a little chubby. He looked to be in his late thirties or early forties and gave me the creeps. I also didn't like him because he looked very much like Mark David Chapman, and as previously stated, I was all about the Beatles at the time. Stephen King once described meeting Mark David Chapman as the lights are on, but nobody's home. This guy had that look going for him. At this point in my life, I had never really been approached by strangers, so I just spoke to him like I would have spoken to anybody else. He asked me about the concert, and I happily chattered away. Then he asked where I was from and who I was with. I pointed out my dad, and then he asked me if I had a boyfriend, at 13 years old. I didn't know yet how to answer such creepy questions or much about dating, but when someone asked me if I had a boyfriend at the time, my answer was always going to be no. I told him I didn't have one and didn't really want one. After all, I was 13. He then started telling me how beautiful I was out of nowhere, how my face was beautiful, how my body was beautiful, and how I seemed so much more grown up than 13. And all the while, he was looking at me in a way that made me feel like I was going to throw up. I had never been looked at like that before, 
and never since. It wasn't one of those looks of, oh, I'm infatuated with you. It was a look of, you're my prey. And of course, it had to come from a gigantic man who could easily overpower me and do whatever he wanted. He started reaching toward me, and I kept taking steps back while talking to him, because I was raised to not be rude. I was so afraid and disgusted by how this man was looking at me that I was nearly in tears. Then, out of nowhere, my dad came running up and said he had been looking for me and that we had to leave right away. The creepy guy ran away, I mean, sprinted. He was clearly not up to anything good. I saw his eyes when my dad ran up, and he looked genuinely afraid, like a deer, caught in the headlights. My dad is useless when it comes to talking about anything complicated. He had a rough childhood that he never really talks about, so he just started chatting, all sunshiny, about where we were going to eat. I tried to shake off what had just happened, but I felt terrible. When we got to the restaurant, I had to go to the ladies' room and cry. I was too innocent even to realize I might have been kidnapped, murdered, or worse. What messed with my head the most was the way he looked at me. I had been excited about puberty, which I had already hit, having breasts and hips was excellent, and I couldn't wait to be an adult. But now, for the first time, I experienced how having a female body could feel like a liability. I blamed myself for a while, thinking something about me must have been wrong to have made an adult man act like that toward me. I know all of that is BS now, but at the time, it was rough, and it took me a long time to get over it, understand, and grow. My dad and I never talked about that day ever again. I never told my mom or stepdad either. I pushed it out of my mind and didn't think about it for a long time afterward. But I'm just grateful my dad showed up when he did and scared that guy off. When I was about 16 years old, I got a job as a personal assistant slash cleaning lady for a wealthy couple living in a big, beautiful mansion on Lake Michigan. It was a great job then, but after a while, I had to quit because of everything going on. And I'll tell you exactly what that was. I made $12 an hour as a 16-year-old girl, which was just crazy to me at the time, but now I know it was because the homeowners couldn't get anyone to stay and work for them. But I didn't see them all that much during the school year, so it was fine. I would work 40 hours a week in the summer and part-time while in school. During the school year, I hardly ever saw the homeowners and was left alone to clean the house. I had a key, alarm, and gate code, so I let myself in and out as I pleased. In the summer months, I had help from a few other employees, but during the school year, it was just me. At first, I loved being in the house alone. Don't get me wrong, the place was gorgeous, right on Lake Michigan, with a beautiful view. I'd always open all the curtains to let the sun shine in and blast the surrounding sound speakers while I cleaned. It wasn't until I was alone that I started noticing how weird the place was. Nothing ever felt welcoming about it. Sure, it was pretty to look at, but it was modern, and everything was marble and stone, not a very homey feeling. My first experience happened when I was cleaning one day in silence. I remember not turning on the music, because I had a bad headache that day. Suddenly, the speakers in the upstairs, part of the house turned on. The way their speaker system worked, you could control it by a touchpad in the kitchen, which would play music everywhere except the basement and main bedroom. To play music in those areas, you had to go to the touchpad, turn it on, and sync it with the rest of the house. The reason this was so alarming was that I was the only one there. I walked up the stairs to check what was going on and figure out why the music had turned on by itself. I looked around and called the homeowner's name, thinking someone had just come in without me noticing. But the doors were still locked, and no one was home. I shut off the music and went back downstairs, not thinking too much of it. It started happening more often though, I'd be listening to music and it would turn off, or it would be off and turn on in a completely different area of the house. I brushed it off as faulty electronics and didn't really think much of it. The second most memorable story I have from working there was when I was cleaning the workout room in their basement. I never wanted to go into this room, and I couldn't tell you why. Something about it just felt weird. 
It was super cold and dark, and I felt anxious in that room, no matter what time of day. I tried to avoid it at all costs, but my boss would get mad when the dust would build up, so I forced myself to go down there once a week to tidy up. So, anyway, I was in the workout room using a broom and mop. I remember sweeping the floor and propping the door open against a machine while I used the mop. Suddenly, the broom fell over, hitting the wall and baseboard on the floor as it fell, causing three distinct thumps. What I heard next scared me so badly, I refused to go into that room by myself ever again. Immediately after the thumps made by the broom falling, three knocks responded in the exact pattern the broom fell, but it was coming from inside the wall. I know what you're thinking. It wasn't an echo. It wasn't some sort of scared animal. It was deliberate knocking. I was utterly alone in a big, quiet house in the middle of nowhere on Lake Michigan, and someone was knocking back at me from inside the wall. To this day, I have no explanation for what I experienced. Lastly, this was the first and only time I've ever seen anything paranormal with my own eyes, and I know it wasn't just me being paranoid or crazy because I was with a co-worker who saw it too. Sometimes my boss would rent out her guest house, and we would clean it before the guests arrived. This guest house had a big glass hallway leading from one main area to another. I was cleaning the house while one of my co-workers, Bob, was standing next to me. Just then, I caught a glimpse of what looked like a boy in a blue shirt running by. I turned my head, just as Bob turned his head too. He asked me if I saw that, and I said yes. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to give the video a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a terrifying tale. See you in the next one.